Welcome to today's episode of The Square. Today we're going to be talking with Brent Kelly, who's a principal in our aviation sector, and Marie Pister, who's the project manager for the uh, LAX Midfield Satellite Concourse. I got right. that name right, yes. That's MSC. correct. Got it. Okay. So um, before we jump in, though, to the project, uh, I'm, I'm excited that we've got both of you here because mm -hmm. um, I... Uh, full disclosure, have worked with Brent and Marie a fair amount in documenting. We've been videoing over the last three or four years the different steps of the the MSC progress. Mm -hmm. um, so now that I've got you in the hot seat, yeah. tell me a little bit about why you're an aviation architect. Well, um, architecture has been in my blood since I was a child. I didn't really know what all it meant, but I knew that I loved to draw, I loved to design. That's what I wanted to do. Sure. So I like to say aviation kind of found me. Uh, so I became an architect, but I uh, had the opportunity to come to work for Corrigan almost 31 years ago now and Gosh. served on our uh, first project was our aviation team, a project at, at, LA, at uh, DFW. And uh, from there, it was kind of like it was just smitten with the aviation architecture because it was so big and so complex. Yeah. It was like really putting a giant jigsaw puzzle together mm -hmm. of all the moving pieces and the parts you had to know and you had to learn. And once you got into it, everything else just seemed so simple. <laughs> so aviation was uh, really that big challenge that I was looking for. Well, and I'm, sur I'm sure that served you well with a project as big as LAX. That's right. Um, Marie, how about you? Well, um, somewhat similar. I've got about 25 years of experience behind me. I've always done large-scale civic, which I really enjoy. I, I like the fact that the complexity is there. It's, it's not an easy job to do. There's lots of moving parts, lots of, move, uh, lots of different operations that have to be handled. Um, and I as well, I like the challenge of the complexity. There's there's the passenger side that, you know, it's up to us to find intuitive ways for them to maneuver through these buildings and not get lost. But the operation side is just as challenging with lots of different um, jobs that have to be done, lots of different um, governing bodies that need to be satisfied in order to, to make everything work out. So, Well, and, I, you know, it wasn't until... I started being able to go and see some of these projects and really see what goes into creating some of the terminals, especially the mm -hmm. satellite terminals, to understand how complex they are. And like, as a passenger, you just don't even realize the thought, hopefully, the thought <laughs> and the intentionality that's gone into the design. Right. And in some ways, if, you, if you're not thinking about the design or you, you're it's a it's a better experience or that's the optimum goal is for you to be able right. to flow through a space very intuitively so yes. let's talk a little bit about LAX okay so Marie can you give me some of the some of the just kind of the raw numbers on square footage and years in the project well we've started the project in well I guess we started the design of the project in February of um, 2015 it's been going on now six years we're um, hoping to close out the project and, and get ready to fly sometime around the end of this year. Um, it is a very large project. We have about 930,000 square feet. Um, that, that includes um, about 90,000 square feet of the Gateway project. Um, we have two large tunnels that go under the airfield in order to move passengers out and then bags back and forth. They are about 56,000 square feet apiece. And then we have the MSC building itself, which is um, right around 730,000 square feet. So it's a very large project with uh, quite a few moving parts. Um, that is the passenger uh, aspect of this project. We also have some added tunnel work that we are using for upgrading baggage systems and screening uh, operations to make the, the whole thing um, flow better and give them better capacity. But for just the MSC project that the passengers will be aware of is about 930,000 square feet. Now this was a uh, team effort. There was a, a group of, of people that came together to do this project. Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, absolutely. Well, any, any large scale aviation project, it's not uncommon to have a group of, of architectural firms that come together to pursue the work and, and develop the work. Uh, this particular project, we, uh, Corgan led and we also had Gensler and GKK Works on the team 
um, working seamlessly together on site. Uh, so we did a co-location team um, and, and we worked so well together that the owner even said, I can't really tell who works for who here. <laughs> uh, so that we felt like that was a very good success. And I think bringing the ta different talents together, the different ideas, uh, we were, it was great that we could debate the ideas between each other and different experience that each other have had. Um, so that what we believe we've ultimately ended up with is the right solution for the specific needs of the client at this time. It was crazy because I remember being in that project trailer and it wasn't like you just couldn't tell like there was a Corgan area or a Ginsler area or anything. There's kind of everybody was um, in kind of an open space, but also it it seemed like there was a lot of cross communication with the different the different groups. There really was. And, and it was really set up specifically. Uh, I really wanted the, the team to gel so much that we did not break pieces of the work apart, but we put team members together from different firms, so they had to work as a team. And again, I think that is the reason for the success. So Brent, since it was a satellite terminal, I know it was important to you that it took some design cues. It, it felt part of the family of the existing facilities mm -hmm. with Tom Bradley. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about how you accomplished that. Well, so one of the things that the owner gave us to begin with was they said that they wanted the project to be complementary. They didn't want it to overpower, but they didn't want it to just be a bland building either. So one of the things that was interesting about Tom Bradley was the arch original architect of that project designed it with a coastal city in mind. And so the building is supposed to represent that big wave as it is breaking on shore. So we really studied what does that mean to us? How do you make it complementary? How do you make it uh, very modular in design? And so one of the things that uh, processes that came up with uh, our thought process in that was keeping with that kind of water theme, ocean theme, was we looked at our building and said, well, you know, we're closer to the ocean than Bradley. So what if we became that kind of swell that is in the ocean sure. before it becomes the big wave. Yeah. And so that really influenced the kind of design thought into that roof form, something that was elegant and sophisticated, yet blended well with the Bradley West project that was done a few years before ours. What about on the inside? Tell me about some of the design inspiration there. Well, the inside, we really kind of talked about this building as designing from the inside out. Uh, if, if you're a passenger at an air, airport, you actually see the air side of a building only through that little window of the airplane. Uh, so most people don't really get to experience that exterior component of the building. So it's really the inside that you really notice and you understand and you wanna make that very intuitive from a passenger perspective. Well, since we were in LA, one of the things of the thought process that came up with design was how do we design this to really reflect the sense of place, the city of LA? And so the thought process that we ultimately developed is grouping our hold rooms or our gate lounges um, together in, in multiple groupings so that we really could reflect kind of the, the neighborhoods of LA. Okay. Uh, so we didn't take a literal approach uh, to say, well, this is West Hollywood and this is the beach cities, sure. but we, we used influences from those communities in, in the color and the materials, the, the choices that we looked at so that you really could kind of get that sense of the main entry point was like the downtown area of LA. And then as you went further down the concourse, you got the sense of going towards the beach cities or out towards the Inland Empire. And so I know that there's a lot of thought behind in any airport project, it having a certain element of being a gateway for the city. And so it, yes. it sounds like that's just kind of subtly reinforcing that connection between the midfield concourse and LA in general. Yeah, it, it really is. Um, and, and one of the design elements that we pulled into the building was a lot of daylight as well. Um, and that's really a big thing in Southern California. And so one of the things that, that really sets this building apart is the amount of daylight that's able to flood into the concourse, uh, but being done so in a controlled um, manner so that you don't get overpowered with the daylight, but you get that sense of, of dynamic rhythm of as the sun changes during the day or moves across the, the sky during the day, you get that change of shadowing. Uh, so a really dynamic feel that you're going to experience in this building. So Marie, I know, you know, there's always challenges with a project of this size, but you had some kind of unique challenges with this project. Well, we had a few, we had a few. Um, <laughs> it, it, um, it lent itself to a lot of growth opportunities. Um, growth one opportunities of the, the is fancy words for having to learn through a problem. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, we, we ran into one of the issues fairly quickly in that um, we started the construction of the building from the north end and worked our way to the south, which is not exactly a normal way for the building to be um, built. Um, I guess normally you would start at the center, the core, where all of the, the brains and the guts of the building are and work your way out. Um, but just logistically, we, we needed to start at the north and work to the, towards the center. Um, as we got to the center, the core of the building, um, that, that area of the building is, is three stories tall, so it's a very large volume, it's a very high and heavy volume. And as they started to try to um, insert the piers into the sand, uh, the sand kind of pushed back. And as, as they drove them down, because they were twisting um, piers, they would twist off. And uh, we had like 30 different piers twist off. And every time that happened, that meant we had to put in three piers to compensate for the one that twisted off. So it turned into quite a challenge. And this was something that kind of ran down the middle of the site, right? I mean, on one side they would go deep enough and on the other side they wouldn't? Pretty much, yeah, pretty much. It was it, the microcosm of the, of the soils were so different in, in just within feet of each other. Mm -hmm. And so some went in just fine, as Marie said, some just twisted right off. And did you, I heard there was also kind of some unique challenges with the tunnel. Um, besides it flooding? <laughs> yeah, we... <laughs> nope, that's the one. <laughs> well, as you said, you know, the, the, the project has gone on a very long time, and one of the challenges was um, as they were doing construction, they had put in some of the main um, site sewer lines, and one of them was not completely finished and capped off yet when we had a very major storm and all of the water went straight down into the tunnel and into the basement of MSC, which wouldn't have been such a huge problem except for they already had a lot of the drywall and the systems in place. So they had to be, um, all the drywall had to come out up to about 12 feet or 12, um, halfway up the wall, three feet or so. And then all of the systems had to be tested and replaced if they were ruined and dried out if they weren't. So that was another nice, nice delay we had to deal with. So then, you know, with the challenges though, I'm sure there is a lot of, of um, joy at seeing something like this slowly but surely kind of come, come to fruition and, and um, ideally be as good as what you had in your head, I would hope. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. You know, that's the that's the the fun part is that your memory gets short and you don't forget all you forget all the challenges once you see the final product. Yeah. And this is going to be a very much a world class facility. Um, I think the the just the design differences, the subtle design differences that were put in, um, and the detailing that went into to uh, the design is really what's going to be the, the the high point for us on this project when it's done. You know, I. I Thinking about that question, there's so many things that run through your mind about what's your favorite thing about the whole building. And, and certainly the, per, the passenger perspective is the greatest piece, but I still kind of always come back to the main core, the, the entry point, because it's not a normal building where people walk through the front door, they have to come up from the tunnel. Um, but it's that main gathering space, if you will. You come in, it's the high volume. Uh, we've got about 90 feet of volume uh, when you when you come up to the That's top of the escalator <laughs> uh, great picture window beautiful finishes um, and the ceiling the undulation of the ceiling that reflects the roof is really something to behold when you see it I, I know that um, uh, it's, it's an area not probably a lot of people will get to see but my favorite view having been out there as the construction has happened it's actually been up from the tower mm -hmm. being able to look out across the roof and being able to to see a lot of what you were talking about with the design inspiration and, and seeing it flow so well with Bradley yeah. is, is really cool. Marie, how about you? Do you have a favorite spot on site? I as well really enjoy the core um, because it is the wow moment of the space. It, it is so large, it makes you feel small. It's not so big that you, you have to move through it in order to experience it but it's right there and 
we're, we're really getting excited. They're going to start hanging the chandelier in two weeks. So that's going to be, again, another massive point for, for this terminal. And it will be the one thing that, that passengers that move through this building will always rec remember. If they see a picture of that chandelier, they'll know exactly where it is. So there are some things that are going to make it really, really interesting yeah, and fun. Absolutely. I think the chandelier is going to be that meet me at the chandelier yeah when somebody's trying to meet up there it's going to be meet me at the chandelier you won't be able it's to be miss great. it won't be able to miss it <laughs> um one of the thing I, I know was maybe a little bit um different or new in, in this project is was the use of, of vr tell me a little bit Absolutely. about how you used vr in this design yeah um vr was very important to us on this design um the midfield satellite concourse while it's a very large building as marie described it was very difficult to fit everything in that needed to go into that space, <laughs> believe it or not. Um, and so what VR helped us to do is to define the different locations, the different uh, elements of the building, mm -hmm. but then take the client into the building before it was ever constructed so they would understand the spatial quality and the amount of room necessary for passengers to flow back and forth. Um, one good example is in that core. Uh, we have two very large elevator cores and there was a concern that when someone came out of the elevator was waiting for an elevator that flow, uh, traffic flowing by would be interrupted and concessions could could cause a problem mm -hmm. um, so we were like trying to explain to them no you've got a lot of room you just don't understand how much room and it really wasn't until we took them into the vr that they could walk around they could understand and experience the grandeur of the space um, and it was really helpful that, that they really could understand not only that space, but what does that experience as you go all the way down the concourse? What is sure. it going to be like if you're waiting for an aircraft or if you're arriving uh, from an international destination? So we were able to take them completely through the building and really understand how passengers would experience that building. Well, I am super excited to see it finished. Uh, and uh, if you'd like to actually get a chance to walk through the uh, midfield satellite concourse uh, take a look in the description below if you're on the video podcast if you're on the audio we'll put it in there as well um, and there'll be a link where you can uh, take a virtual tour of the uh, concourse from your phone uh, brent marie thank you so much for being here thank you for joining us on this episode of the square and we'll see you next week <laughs>